Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you once again for joining us here for what promises to be another exciting uh, session of uh, good conversation. We've got three very diverse entrepreneurs uh, with a single purpose of wanting to change the world. Uh, uh, different stories, different backgrounds, uh, very different businesses that they're operating in, but as I pointed out, uh, what what sets them apart and yet what unites them is their passion and the purpose that they're working with. Uh, let me start by asking you, Dipinder, uh, it's been, what, 11 years of uh, starting Zomato, of running Zomato, uh, and we've had this conversation several times in the past of what it takes to actually build a business here uh, in India. Uh, take me through the journey so far. You've managed to bring Zomato from addressing very few cities to now, what, 500 cities across India, and of course, uh, over a billion dollars in valuation. I think the valuation part is sort of a curse right, right now, but um, yeah, the journey has been great. It's been 11 years. We started off with something very small, and it has uh, actually become something which is, which is beyond what we ever thought it would. Uh, we are in 550 cities in India right now. We serve about 48 million people every month. Um, 48 million people every month? Yes. Okay. And uh, outside of India, we serve about another 25 million people as well. So we have a business which runs in 11 countries. And we know the difference in running a business in India and running, running a business in multiple other markets as well. Okay, uh, I'll get to the difference in running a business in India and running a business uh, uh, in 11 different countries, which is what Zomato is doing today. But Dipinder, you know, uh, when you started off in 2008, and I don't know how many of you know the backstory of Dipinder, uh, but he was a consultant with Bain, and that's when he decided to, uh, to get started with Zomato and, and set up Zomato to address the pain point of people who wanted to order out so it started off as aggregating uh, menus and and today has become uh, a food delivery technology uh, driven platform what has been the hardest part of this journey I think the hardest part is to actually uh, hire the number of people that we hire how many people do you have today uh, we have 250,000 people that we hired in the last 18 months Wow can you repeat that? 250,000 people in the last 18, 18 months. months. Okay. And uh, trying to get access to people and trying to explain them that they can actually have a job where they only work with a phone in their hand and they don't need to talk to anyone else, blah, 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 right? So uh, that's been super hard, but we've been finally able to get there. Uh, how, you know, when you started off, Dipinder, and I'm sure that people uh, in your family would have wondered that. How much did you have to sort of combat that mindset and has it changed significantly uh, over the years? No, it actually still hasn't changed. It uh, hasn't changed? You know, they still don't get why people even order food from restaurants or why people don't cook, don't eat home, home cooked food. I still get all these questions. <laughs> so so you, haven't, you haven't been able to convince people about that, no, right? No, absolutely not. So they, do they still ask you, what is your business model? Kya hai? They've actually given up on everything. So, <laughs> like, do, do uh, whatever you want. It's okay. <laughs> well, Brad, let me ask you because, uh, again, very, very interesting story here. Uh, 16 is when you experimented with getting into business for the very first time. Several businesses down the line which were not successful. Uh, then you got onto a successful business which you eventually sold and you've used that money for this venture, uh, which is basically providing access to education. And ladies and gentlemen, this man has been to India 41 times in the last three years, and India, six in the last six years, and India is the only market he intends to service uh, to start with. Brad, take us through your story. Sure. First, I want to mention, I actually downloaded his app two days ago <laughs> because I wanted to order different food. It was great. Um, so I, uh, I, talk about my story and why, why I'm doing this in India and because and, a lot of people always ask me, my, my family when I first started, people I, I deal with across North America wonder why. I'm from Canada. Anyways, I grew up very poor. Uh, I was one of these individuals that struggled with education, struggled with poverty. I left home when I was 16, so I've been on my own for a very long time. I'm, I'm 48, 
now, 48. And um, I, uh, over the course of my, my career, I realized that I was missing a lot of skills. Good at coming up with ideas, solving problems, big problems. Built some companies that competed with some very big companies and ended up taking a lot of market share away from them. Um, started producing product in China so for one of the companies I built. And I came across true poverty that I'd never experienced before in Canada. And it bothered me so much that I decided I wanted to make a difference and do something different. So in 2008, I decided that I was going to build a company that can solve education for everybody. Mm. And it's a big goal. You try telling that to investors, education for everybody, you get no money. And that, that's what ended up happening. People thought, it's too big, no one's done it, it's impossible, it's not, gonna, it's not gonna happen. So I realized that the only way to initiate this company was to self-fund it, to build it ourselves with our own money. And as I started building the company, um, I'd go to family, friends, neighbors, people who are police officers, people who are construction workers, people I knew, and say, you know, this is what I'm doing for India. I, I, need, I need more investment. Um, why India, though, Brad? So I'll, I'll tell you why. So I, um, I looked at the three emerging markets that Canada was focused on. And I was trying to figure out how do I enter a new market to solve <coughs> education for all. And I had heard Prime Minister Modi's speech in New York City back in 2012, 13, where he talked about India had the, uh, had the potential to be the world's skilled workforce. And um, when I heard about that, I, I didn't know much about India. I'd never been to India before. Um, and um, when I first came to India, I got to tell you, I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with the food, the hospitality, the people, everything. And uh, what, what reminded me so much of, of um, why I'm doing this is my upbringing, while it was nowhere near the level of poverty that, I, that I've seen here, mm. um, I realized that I had a unique skill, that I'm good at building businesses, I'm good at figuring out problems, I'm very patient, so working in this, this country, is, is, you've you got to be really patient. Um, and uh, I also realized that um, because of the patience that I had, I'm good at planning, I'm good at organizing. I spent the first three years in India with not with not not selling anything, I wasn't trying to sell something to, to to a company to try and generate revenue. I really wanted to understand what is the root problem with education, hmm. not just for corporations, but for rural India. I've spent time in villages, pulling water out of a well with with the women in, in the villages. I working and making roti and you know all that kind of stuff and trying to understand. What are the ch challenges they're facing in, in those areas? I spent time at high schools in Ranji with the students to understand a 15-year-old perspective. I spent time on the campus, uh, ca uh, campuses yeah. with university students for a week trying to understand what does a university student go for, for with dealing with corporations, governments. So I spent a, a significant amount of time trying to understand what does the education landscape mm. look like? Mm. What's fundamentally the problem? And, and I, I came to India and stayed in India because I loved it so much, the people here are just amazing. And, and then I realized that um, many years ago that I, I know how to solve this problem for education for everybody. And people still think it's, it's, it's impossible, but we put in place, my business plan is over 200 pages that detail everything from rural area to skilling platforms and how to do it. And then I traveled the world. So I met, I went to meet, meet with educators in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, Germany. Right trying to bring them all together for India. And right. you haven't had much luck doing that from what I'm given to understand, but I'll, I'll get to that in just, in just a second, but let me bring <laughs> Jeremy in, into the conversation as well. Uh, and I think Jeremy uh, gives hope to a lot of people who are Instagram because he started his business literally with an Instagram account. How many, yes. how many followers did you have before you actually uh, decided to get launched with your business? Right, so um, the, the starting point really was hopefully to give anyone here in the room that has children that are working out what they want to do with their lives that you can build a business from absolutely anywhere so 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 don't go after them if they're on instagram they could be sitting at the ht summit a couple of years down the line exactly, right <laughs> exactly so the um the, the starting point of the business is the very passionate belief that travel is a force for good in the world that it is a universal language that connects people regardless of age regardless of gender regardless of income regardless of where you come from if you get out into the world and you travel you can experience life in such a way that opens your mind, that opens your horizons. And there has been this enormous movement towards mobile and social that has mm. connected people um, in, a, in a way that has never happened before. And so yeah. if you put out into the world this belief that travel is a positive force, that it is really one of the true industries in the world that has the ability to change people's lives by experiencing it, you can have impact. And so for us, what happened was 
a community started to grow on Instagram around beautiful destinations, which was a group of individuals posting and sharing their experiences of their lives. And five years ago when it started, um, these were just normal people, teachers, artists, um, musicians, just sharing what their perspective was of life day to day through this Instagram platform. And uh, for the first two years, made absolutely no money. Uh, had no business plan, had no business model at all, mm. but... As opposed to Brad there, who has like 200 pages yes. of office business plan, yes. okay. Yes, <laughs> but through complete serendipity, um, the Crown Prince of Dubai, Sheikh Hamdan, was a very high profile individual uh, and is a very high profile individual in Dubai and decided to take to social media and started following beautiful destinations. And so the team in Dubai Tourism reached out to us and said, um, you know, he's following you, why? Who are you guys? What are you doing? We are looking to reposition our tourism effort around the world to activate social and mobile. And so we're launching our national tourism brand around the hashtag MyDubai. Now, at the time, uh, they sent me a number of messages on Instagram, which I ignored because I thought they were a joke and there was no business. And it really was just an Instagram account. And they said, listen, um, you know, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars with um, marketing agencies and we have an audience that is significantly smaller than yours would you come to Dubai? And that became our first client. So with Dubai and the Burj Al Arab, that was our first hotel client. And that gave us the springboard. So to, how many, to how many uh, countries are you now working with? Because that's the focus. Yeah. You're working with governments around the world. Exactly. Right? So, so the business is as a strategy and nation branding agency that helps governments at the state, uh, country and city level to do their national brand and to move it into a space where young people who are mobile, who are social, who are consuming content and deciding what they do in the world in a completely different way, mm. helping them to do that. So really to be the bridge between um, the group of individuals that are currently running the world and are used to communicating in a certain way, um, making that bridge between the group of individuals that will inherit the world and now right. going out into the world and using digital and social to You know, inspired. so while the three of you are addressing very different pain points in very different uh, segments of the market, one thing is common and that is that you're using technology to be able to reach out to your audience and to address the deficits that you believe exist in the market. Dipinder, let me start by asking you uh, about how technology has changed the rules of the game. Uh, it's the big opportunity, it's the big leveler, it's brought down the thresholds of, or the barriers before you enter a business but it's also made it easier for your competitors to, uh, uh, to scale up and scale up very quickly. So how do you see uh, the tech platform as, as it evolves now 11 years down the line? So, um, and, and how do you create moats around it? So I think uh, maybe 10 years ago, you could have a purely tech-driven business like uh, with nothing else uh, ar uh, around it. But nowadays, I think a tech-only business is not a thing. Right? Okay. You have to have other things that are surrounding your tech to be able to build a business which is large and great. Um, and I think like for us, um, tech is just an enabler which helps us reach our customers. It actually gives us access to millions of people. Mm. But the business is not tech. Okay. Right? So, so the business is not tech anymore, even though that was really the genesis of, of the business. So uh, what is it that you believe will be the add-ons to, to the technology side of this business? And how do you ensure that A, you continue to keep your costs down, uh, that B, you continue to offer more uh, in, by way of differentiation so that you stand out? So um, I can answer that question in terms of the... Uh, uh, vision that we have in terms of what we want uh, Zomato to be. Uh, we say that we want to build a company which, uh, which helps for, which actually serves better food for everyone, mm. right? which means that, uh, the, that the quality of food that we eat right now, uh, most of the vegetables are full of pesticides, most yeah. of the meats are full of antibiotics. We want to get rid of all of that. And, uh, so the question that a lot of people in the audience will then have is, but you're only a delivery platform. How are you going to ensure that exactly. my food and my vegetables don't have pesticides in that? So uh, that's where the whole thing comes in, right? Because a lot of companies do try all these clean food startups. Like there are a lot of clean food startups, but they're never able to get to a large scale. And we think that our access to B2C uh, by through restaurants and millions of people who use our platform platform gives us a means to an end to be able to solve that problem. Okay. So we are already supplying clean food, uh, vegetables and meats to restaurants, about 600 of them right now, okay. which is almost 
10 odd percent of our revenue right now. So, okay. and we, uh, and all these restaurants which buy from us, we put a sticker for them on the pla on the platform, which says "Hyper Pure uh, Certified." Hyper okay. Hyper so, Pure. So there's Reserve a certification yes. as well. Okay. So that actually drives more customers to these restaurants because these customers are also looking for clean food. So these restaurants also win. And since we are directly working with farmers on the side, we end up paying almost three x the amount of money to farmers uh, than they would have made from any other okay. channel. So it's, so it's, it's the works. circular economy yes. that you're uh, that you're working on. Uh, you know, I, I want to address the funding uh, uh, question with you, Dipinder, because uh, it's it's been a cash intensive and a cash guzzling business, like with uh, most startups in India today. Uh, that have achieved unicorn status, and uh, you know the, the thing with the unicorn is it's mythical. So, uh, so what kind of pressure does that put on you, and, and how much of the road to profitability are you focusing on now? So, um, I think when somebody else uh, who's trying to compete with you has a lot of money, uh, for a short period of time, you have to react with money itself. Okay. Right. Um, you have to react with money itself. I mean, you have to have raised, you have to raise almost a similar amount of cash and also So if your competitor is raising a billion dollars, you have to raise at least a billion, if not a billion and a half. I mean, I think one third is fine. Okay. Right. So okay. if somebody raises a billion, one third, uh, I'm good with one third. Uh, but eventually that, that's not the, that's not the play, right? You have to build value for your customers, for your mm. partners, for everyone that you work with. And that finally wins. So, is it getting harder to raise money today? It is harder, but I think good uh, good companies can raise money at hard times, good times doesn't matter. Okay, and how, what is what is the runway like uh, at this point in time? How much are you hoping to raise? How much do you believe you need to raise? So our uh, burn rate is almost one third of what it was six months ago. Okay. So our runway is like 15, 18 months. And we're going to raise about five to six hundred million dollars in the next month or so, which gives me runway for seven years. I don't know. Okay, so you're going to raise between five to six hundred million dollars in the next one month. So that is a is a big headline coming in there from uh, from the Pinder. I think everybody already knows. Everybody that, so. already knows it. Okay, <laughs> fine. Okay, we we've just reiterated that and got it from the horse's mouth. But Brad, you know, speaking of funding and monetization, and at the end of the day, uh, yes, you're you're trying to do good by providing uh, access to education to every child or every individual uh, to start with in India and hopefully the rest of the world. The question is monetization uh, and and how do you make this business sustainable so um, and you what put in about 18 million dollars of your own money f through friends and family to get this business up and running yeah yeah quite a, quite a bit of money um, you know for our business the, the biggest challenge with raising funds is quite frankly I'm from North America and this is India um, most people in North America don't really understand India they don't really stand understand this part of the world and then when I mentioned education emerging markets India and I live here, I live over there. Um, funding has not been an easy discussion with any of them. Um, but from, from a sustainability perspective, you know, there are lots of ways to sustain a business like this. One, through government support, obviously. Another way is through business and skilling up. There is a huge opportunity with corporations across, across all of India. They have a lot of B2B businesses. And our focus has not been revenue generation, just to be clear. Our focus has been to build the proper models mm. that make sense for this country. There are lots of people that come and sell courses. And the last company, I, I built was in EdTech, and we, we had customers like IBM, and sorry, not IBM, Nike, BMW, Toyota, IATA, you know, we had in Canadian government, we had a lot of customers that we built for. And prior to that, we had Disney, Marvel, Nickelodeon, and another right. company I built. So generating revenue is not hard. It really isn't if you have the right models. For this country, there are different levels. There's a big pyramid, the top of the pyramid, corporations, people can afford, then mm. they, they will pay higher from a corporate perspective. The bottom of the pyramid, it has to be subsidized. There has to be some sort of level of, of uh, government support. I've dealt with uh, influencers around the world that are billionaires that, that have indicated to us that they will help subsidize funding for different pockets and, and different types of populations mm. that need that support. Um, our goal is, of course, to be profitable and sustainable. So we have a, 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 a skilling program that, that is specifically for businesses that we can make money that can help uh, support our, our other initiatives. Right. But in, in countries like India, it's economies of scale. You know, you sell you sell products for a, a, a low enough amount. Yeah. Um, it supports and it gets the individuals committed to the programs because right. free doesn't always work. And and it, the, there's proof in the model when you look at some of the large companies that've got 
tons of investment, yeah. like Coursera and some of these other guys, yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. It's not sustainable. Mm. Um, they, they, they are, they've now pivoted a year ago or whatever it was to focus on B2B to, mm. to try and generate those revenues. Mm. Our model has always been like that. We've mm. built it to be sustainable. The unfortunate part is we've had to invest our own money to get to the point we are because the reality is no investor in North America was going to invest in R&D in a foreign country. What, in, what about Indian investors? Haven't you tried reaching out to Indian so, investors? So I, I have the same problem. I'm, I'm from Canada. But even Indian investors yeah, say, yeah. you're from the, Canada, so you won't understand the, India. Yes, I get that all the time. <laughs> I've, met, you know, I've met so many people that have told me, well, wait a minute. The, the first time I met with a, a group of directors I was working with, the first thing they said to me is, hold on a second. You're a white guy trying to build stuff in India. Have you been here before? And I said, actually, this was my second trip. <laughs> and, and they're like, yeah, you're not going to get any funding here. Mm. And you know, if, if, uh, six years later, we've built out an infrastructure, 53,000 programs, 100 global educators. Some of the largest in the world have joined us. Right. And leveraging technology. Technology is an enabler. It's not the solution. Because yeah. there are areas and villages across all of India yeah. that they don't have access to technology. Yeah. And you can't. So you have to have models that support those areas as well, which we've put together. Mm. A lot of ed techs that are coming into India from North America or wherever, they're trying to sell courses and they yeah. don't have solutions for any rural areas because their business model hasn't been established or set up with that in mind. Yeah. Our yeah. has. So we will make money, mm. um, but making money is not the... the it's, not, it's not driving you today. It has never driven me. Right. Money has never been a driver for me. Don't get me wrong. Anybody that invests that is a driver, that's a driving force. But the focus has been to solve this problem. We solve this problem, yeah. then money will follow. Yeah. If you chase money, you'll never solve this problem. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get what you're saying. But Jeremy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, monetization, uh, yes, that does, that does deserve a round of applause. Uh, monetization, yes. uh, is it really going to depend mostly on government funding? How's it going to work for you? Sure. Uh, so so we, have, we have three ways. The first is, um, is, is through government. So working with these nations and helping them to, um, to build their creative brand, build their content. Um, the second is we have also turned the social channel that we started with on Instagram uh, into one of the largest tourism communities in the world now. So there are 25 million people that come to beautiful destinations on uh, Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, on Weibo in China. That's mm. one of our fastest growing platforms. And so there is a monetization model in helping distribute content to, to that group of consumers on those platforms. Mm. Um, but actually the most exciting space for us, and I think is something that we're certainly seeing grow a lot also in India, is um, direct-to-consumer business models selling just through digital and social channels. So yeah. we are, um, we've just launched our first direct-to-consumer products. At, you can buy um, the prints that we shoot, you can buy the products that we're wearing, and we're seeing a lot of people who are coming and getting involved in the feedback loop of how they create products by going onto social mm. media, talking with us, and mm. then using that as the platform mm. for us for, for product development. You know, uh, Jeremy is using social media to his advantage. I want to ask you, Dipinder, uh, the, the world of social media, it's a, it's, a, it's a different beast, a different animal altogether, an opportunity and, and also a challenge. How do you deal with it? And how many messages do you reply to? Mera order nahi aaya abhi tak. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think 85% uh, of the tweets that I get are negative. Yeah. But almost 85 or 25? What did you say? 85. 85% 85 of the tweets negative, that you get are negative. While our App Store reviews are 96% positive. Hmm. So social media is just a customer complaint center for the most part yeah right yeah so so you deal with it like one of those channels that's huh. it so do you respond yourself we have a customer care team responding. you have a customer care team that's responding uh, responding to that but does it bother you and you know uh, in, in the in the last few months we've seen a fair degree of outrage over uh, some stories that have that have happened uh, where zomato has been involved and uh, how do you and i know that it was a it was a very brave position that you took uh, in, in the middle of that social media onslaught to come out and say look this is this is what we do and we will not discriminate on the basis of religion and so on and so forth uh, how how do you deal with that? How do you cope with that when you have, uh, you know, uh, people on Twitter trying to downgrade the app and so on and so forth? What does that do for you as a leader personally, and how do you respond to that? So uh, this wasn't the first time that we have taken a stand for something that we believe in, uh, but this was, I think, one of the hardest stances that we have taken ever. Um, so we actually just put that tweet out, and then we saw all the outrage. We just had to shut it off. Like we just stopped looking at it. Finally, the bigger did you expect that response? Not at all. Not at all. Um, it was actually quite a surprise for me. I didn't think that we live in such a world. Like 
that was a reality check for me. And uh, the bigger uh, the bigger issue was what happened offline, mm. not just the social media. I think social media is fine, like that's just online and mostly harmless. But um, we had to actually ramp up security in a lot of our offices. You had to network. ramp up security across offices. Yes, yes, that that was the scary thought after that. Mm. Okay, uh, and I can understand how difficult a situation that must have been. But you know, coming back to I think the larger issue that Dipinder made, that there are some areas which are non-negotiable, and there are some principles that you will stand by no matter what the consequences are on you yourself as an individual or for the business. Uh, and let me start by asking you, Brad, uh, have there been moments like that where you have said, only so far and no further? Um. Yeah, you know, when dealing with social media, I got, I got off a lot of it um, simply because of that. Lots of negative comments. People just use it as, as posts. Um, in building in building any business, it doesn't matter what it is, the naysayers are a lot because a lot of people, for for whatever reason, if they don't think it's possible, they want to make you feel like you sh you don't know what you're doing. The reality is, when you're building a company, you know, we're building things that no one has done before. Right? So we make mistakes. We don't know the answers. If we know the answers, then every business would be successful. So there's an there's a, a image where that shows where you start a business, where you end, and it goes up and it goes like this. And then it pops out. And everyone thinks it's this. Yeah. Right? And the yeah. reality is this in here, yeah. unless you're the entrepreneur, you, don't, you, don't, you will never understand what mm. we go through. So mm. there's always these points in, 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 in even building this company. This has probably been the hardest company I've built only because it's on the other side of the world for us. Um, but it's also a different culture. It's a different learning experience. And I've had pushback from so many people. Every day, people say, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You shouldn't be doing this. And, but at the end of the day, I, I go back to my core beliefs and who I am and how I believe that life should be and how I believe that I have the ability to do this. And there's been times where I sit there and I think, you know what? It doesn't matter who's going to try and stop me. Mm. I know what I know, and yeah. I know I have a passion for doing this. I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to push down every wall that I face, no matter what, no matter how many people say it's impossible. It's only impossible until I prove it's possible. Absolutely. And then people will be like, hey, what a great idea. <laughs> and I think it's that line. <laughs> no? Yes, and more, more power to you and to, uh, and to entrepreneurs who do the impossible. But Jeremy, on, on that larger issue, and I would imagine that you know, you're, you're probably getting asked by governments around the world mm. or other organizations mm. uh, to, to market them globally. Mm. And, and social media, uh, especially Instagram, etc., does have uh, some degree of whitewashing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is there a point where you will say, uh, no, uh, you know, I will, I will tell the story as is and I will not airbrush it to make it look prettier than it is? Yes, absolutely. Even if that means letting go of the contract, even if that means losing that client? Yes, so there are, there are two principles for us. One is um, we decided with the audience that we have that we would never run other people's content. And so across all the social channels that we have, there are many, many brands, um, not, not just governments, but brands who would like to pay to get access to the 25 million people. Um, we never run content that didn't come from some kind of place that we were involved in the creation or the people that we worked with created the content versus pure advertising. Um, but the big driver for us really is, is around sustainability and around conservation, mm. and the wider positioning of the development of the sustainable tourism industry and really um, in many ways, those two things being at odds where so much of travel um, is not sustainable. Yeah. And actually, we really do need to educate people about how to travel. Uh, so are governments willing to take that feedback on board? Yes and no, candidly. Uh, some of them are trying to understand. I think one of the biggest challenges that we're trying to push really hard is the idea of regional dispersion, where you hear stories like Barcelona or stories like Venice or stories like Reykjavik in Iceland, which have been incredibly successful at tourism to the extent that now locals don't want tourists because there's so many tourists yeah. coming to the place yeah. and they're ruining the natural environments. But yeah. you go two, three hours away from those major hubs and there are places that are incredibly beautiful, right. that are absolutely desperate for the right. economic development that tourism can bring. Right. And so finding ways to actually work with local governments and say, let's either invest in infrastructure that will grow parts of the country that don't yet have tourism, but right. have the natural resources, yeah. or let's find ways to actually get out to consumers that if they went a little bit further off the beaten path, yeah. they'd have just as amazing a travel experience and then everybody would yeah. benefit. That, that makes sense. Uh, there's questions that have come in and I, I, let me ask uh, Dipinder uh, and Brad because uh, it deals with the comment that you made about uh, why it's very different doing business in India versus the 11 other countries that you operate in. Dipinder, I'll start by asking you and then, then I'll get Brad to comment. 
So um, I think India is a young market. Like there are a lot of nobody knows the rules. Uh, I mean, and the kind of businesses that are being built right now, they actually don't fall into any regulatory area right now. Should there be regulation? Yes, but thoughtful. Okay. So, you, so you're in favor of some regulation. There, ha there has to be. There should be some. Okay. What kind of regulation? What should it regulate? I think uh, one of the biggest areas uh, that we need to work on, and uh, so do a lot of other markets as well, lot, a lot of other countries as well, is to um, actually enforce the law that's already out there. Okay. That's the big issue huh. everywhere. When you say enforce the law, I would imagine that you're all legally compliant, right? So yes, <laughs> I we mean, are. Which, which we law? We have to be. We have yeah. to be. I mean, we are, we are large and we have like public companies. So you're saying that the, the, the smaller the players. Partners that work with, that we work with. Like we, uh, I mean, the uh, people violate contracts with us all the time. Okay. Okay. Right? And we can't do anything. And this is it. different from the, the global experience? Uh, uh, relative relatively degrees, yeah, but okay. yeah. well uh, that shows up in the World Bank's ease of doing business uh, index as well contractual obligations not our strong point Brad uh, very quickly the difference between operating in India uh, and uh, and global so it's a little opposite actually because in Canada and w contracts are very important people sign contracts what I've noticed here uh, oh sorry what I've noticed here is that it's more about the relationships you have with people um, I've come to realize that a contract is a contract until you no longer have the relationship, then the contract doesn't exist. Um, you know, in, in, in Canada, it's not like that. So I, I've spent over the years, I, I'm writing another book. Uh, the, About sorry. India? I am. Are, are, are contracts not working no, in India? No, it's, it's called, so I, I wrote a book on the businesses I've built, and um, I'm writing another one that specifically talks about building a business for India. Okay. And it's, the title is Building a Billion Relationships. Because the nice. reality is, what, nice. what I noticed about this country is the people, the people that you work with, it's really about you know, connecting with them. I, I've worked with people that I've been invited to their families' homes, met their yeah. parents. Um, I've done things with, I've been invited to weddings of people I don't even know. Um, <laughs> it, 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 and I realize it's not like that in Canada or the yeah. US. They yeah. want to sign a contract and you're obligated to that contract no matter what. Yeah. Um, here it's not like that, which I prefer, honestly. I prefer the relationship side. You prefer side. that, okay. I prefer working with people, <laughs> not with paper. Okay, you prefer working with people and not with paper. That's a good good way of putting it. Jeremy, a question for you that's coming from Alok Srivastav. What plans do you have for India? Prime Minister Modi is highlighting tourism's yes. importance. Uh, yes. So are, are you working with Incredible India? We are hoping to. It's so exciting, really. It's the, the shift that we're seeing around the world is that traditionally the tourism industry was seen as one of the softer industries. Jobs, economic output, growth came from manufacturing, came from the harder industries where um, you know they've existed for a long time. But people are now realizing one in 10 jobs jobs in the world is in the travel and tourism industry. It is uh, the second fastest growing segment in the majority of countries around the world. And young people that are coming into the workforce are incredibly excited and inspired mm. about the ability to spread the culture out into the world through travel. Um, so we have a huge Indian base. Um, you'll be unsurprised to hear that Indians on social media are very passionate. They're very vocal. Yes, um, they've been their nose all about that. <laughs> um, I mean, touch wood to date, we've really only seen the positive side of support um, and really of national pride. And this is something that we feel yeah. very, very much um, about getting behind and giving voices to Indians and getting out into the world and saying, look at all these amazing things that exist yes. in this country. And we have the ability to tell those stories. So um, we're not working with Incredible India yet, but hopefully we will be very, hopefully very soon. Hopefully you will. Yes. We wish you the very best of Thank luck you. with that. Thank uh, you. Uh, Dipinder, uh, more questions in for you. Pratik uh, from IIT Delhi has sent in a question. Uh, you said that the billion dollar valuation is uh, both an opportunity and a curse. Why? I think uh, when you raise money at a billion dollar valuation, people expect you to become a $5 billion company in a couple of years' time. And uh, in order to become a $5 billion company, you have to raise money again at a $3 billion <laughs> so valuation. It never ends. <laughs> so you have to become a $10 billion company in a couple of years' time, and then you raise more money. It just never ends. Right, so um, uh, you have to like take a conscious call on whether you're building to drive up the valuation, or yeah. are you actually trying to create value for yeah, your customers? Yeah, yeah. So it becomes about focusing on valuation as opposed to creating value. But you know, uh, and I think again, this is going to be uh, beneficial for everyone here who's listening. Uh, what we've seen happen with uh, WeWorks, for instance, um, and this difference between how public markets value a company and how private markets value a company. Uh, as as an entrepreneur who is looking 
possibly at an IPO a few years down the line. How do you see this? I think uh, going public is sort of growing up. Mm. Right? So it's like Have you grown up enough yet or are you still, are you still in the teenage phase? I think we are halfway there. Uh, I don't know whether to call it a teenage phase or not. We already publish our annual reports and yeah. uh, we are very, very transparent as a company. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, we should only always focus on creating value for your customers, for your partners. Right, and uh, everything else falls into place. There is no, there is, n there is no reason why you, sh you should optimize for the valuation bit of it, because that should be an outcome, not a metric to drive. Yeah, I, and I have to give you full props for transparency. I think you're one of the very few people uh, that actually puts out data, details, numbers on what is going on with the company, what the numbers look like, and not not too many people actually do that. So, uh, props to you for that, uh, Brad. There's a question that's coming for you: Is quality or quantity? the bigger problem considering employability is the main challenge that India faces today. Mr. G.B. Bagai has sent in that question for you. It's actually both. They go hand in hand. You have to have quality education. You have to have um, the quality of as well. It can't just be random stuff. To address the employability issue, this, this is where the globalization comes in. It's very critical. In India, there's a supply and demand issue, challenge. There are more people than there are jobs, right? Either, either the people have to become entrepreneurs or you create new jobs. What's interesting around the world, there are more jobs than there are people, right? So this is where Prime Minister's comment years ago was, India can be the skilled workforce of the world. The challenge with that is the education systems in other countries have different levels of, of quality, standard, mm. and access, accessibility, affordability, all those different issues. So part of, our, part of our model and what we were trying to do is create education to employment, not just for local opportunities, but for global opportunities, opening up opportunities in countries like Canada and the US and Australia mm -hmm. and Germany and Japan and mm -hmm. all over the world. And this is why we, part of our model has been traveling around speaking to different countries on how do we create this collaboration. But are you worried that in increasingly, uh, uh, in a world where globalization is being seen now as a threat and as an evil and the need for protection and, and, and more insular thinking on the part of governments, that this two-way or this global export of people uh, is perhaps going to be something that will be hit or impacted? No. Aside from the U.S., it seems to be internal focus. The rest of the countries I've met with want people. They want this collaboration. You know, we're one world, right? We're, while we have multiple, multiple countries, multiple cultures, you know, especially in Canada, I grew up with multiple cultures. I have many Indian friends, Filipino friends, Italian friends, African friends. Like, our country is just so multicultural. So we grew up with this built in our DNA. Yeah. Global collaboration is part of who we are. And the, the countries that don't want that, well, that's fine. That, that's, mm. that's the way they, they're, mm. they're going to live. But you know what? The world's a big place, yeah. and those countries will just be isolated from the growth and the talent that we can share amongst each other, mm -hmm. and the economies and the opportunities that we can grow together with. Yeah. We have a ton of opportunity. India has the potential to be the workforce of the world. They have to get access to the education of the world. They can't just, lo they can't just be localized, yeah. otherwise it will be a local opportunity. And the supply-demand challenges that are faced here mm won't be solved. It yeah. could be solved if I were to tell you, hey, there's a million jobs available in North America. We just need to align yeah. the people together. Yeah, yeah you, you're right about that. But Dipinder, you know, on the issue that Brad was talking about, and we've got a similar question <clears throat> coming in, as you scale, and you know, you're talking about what, 46 million orders that you're completing and so on and so forth. Uh, what what are the big challenges uh, to ensure that there is consistency, uh, that, you know, that, that there isn't the customer grievance that you're going to have to deal with? How do you ensure quality standards? I think that's a process which sort of gets better over time. Um, so this goes hand in hand with scaling. Like, so we have scaled, for almost, um, we've scaled from almost like 3 million orders a month to almost 40 million orders right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, and this has been this has been done over the last eighteen months. So, customer. Complaints. That's not a lot of time. I mean, you know, to, to go to forty six million dollars uh, million orders a month in eighteen months that that requires execution at the back end of a very different kind. That's true, but uh, I think. Uh, you have to bring your partners along with you, even they have to scale with you. Your rider community has to learn how to, how to 
deliver orders faster. They have to learn how to use maps on their phones, right? <laughs> so, so it's a it's a whole lot of. Um, I mean, there's so much to do there, and uh, even right now, where we are actually making things better on an everyday basis, mm. right? We are training our partners, we're training our riders, we're training our own people on how to handle customer grievances, mm. and um, I mean, all things said and done, it's food, right? Somebody will like the food, some or somebody will not like the food. There is no standardized SKU in our uh, in our business, so we have to just put our best foot forward all the time. Yes, yes. It sounds like you need some skilling programs. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Nicely slipped in. And he's already he's already downloaded the app, so yes. you owe him one. <laughs> so, Jeremy, uh, let me ask you this. As a, as a young entrepreneur who got into business when you were about 20, mm -hmm. uh, it's been five years that you've been running this now. What's the aspiration? I mean, what is it that you, you see yourself doing over the next few years? Um, we're in the very fortunate position today that we connect with millions and millions of people around the world. And I think if you think about the future of work, uh, the organization that we started literally started on Instagram. Yeah. And so, so how do I get a million followers on Instagram? To be honest, it's less about the numbers. It's more about the, the message and the delivery you have right. with those people. So, um, you know, it's been said a million times that people may not remember exactly what you do. Yeah. And they may not remember exactly what you say. But how you, know, you made them feel. How you feel, right? Yeah. And that is really what the power A of travel is. And this whole generation of people that are now coming out into the world that are using mobile and social to connect with each other and feel. And I think I would absolutely echo everything that Brad said about looking in the future where we are more connected. You're seeing more Indians going out into the world and exploring and spreading their culture and spreading their experiences than have ever happened before. There's a more upwardly mobile society that travels more. I think last year, 1.2 billion international travel trips happened and it's only expected to, to rise. So we had this enormous opportunity to capture this global positive sentiment of culture. What's your if, dream destination? Oh, I have some, I can't <laughs> <tell> you, that, <laughs> Is that, that going to put you on a spot? I, I get asked that so much. Um, it's, less, it's less about one place, and again, it's more about the feeling of meeting people, to be honest. That's the biggest thing. That's for a politically me correct travel. answer. You're worried about your <laughs> clients, aren't you? <laughs> it's, it's funny because we, we, we often walk this fine line between going to a place and saying how much we enjoy it and having experiences that we may not want to always talk about. And so the reality is for us that, uh, very personally for me, I've had amazing experiences in Japan. That's been something that I've absolutely loved. Japan is one of my favorite places in the world. And of course, India. I mean, we came here in 2016. Um, our first uh, hotel partnership in the region uh, allowed us to come and experience India. And we're here for the Holi Festival. Um, and I went out, um, sorry, for, for Diwali rather. I went out into, um, uh, into the middle of the countryside and right. pitched a ride back in with a group of women on a, on a, on a truck and they had the truck filled with marigolds, all these sacks of marigolds. And so that experience coming back into the and city. And that would have made then, for a very nice Instagram picture. Well, I mean, I was about to say that literally millions and millions of people saw that uh, and then connected with that. And that started a discussion and that opened up the opportunity for us to be in India. So it was something that you do and you probably take for granted and you see it happen every single year. But yeah. people around the world had not seen it to that extent until they yeah. saw it on digital. So, so Brad, uh, almost two decades uh, of, of running businesses, selling businesses, starting new businesses. As an entrepreneur, as a serial entrepreneur, what's the aspiration today? Um, after I started, uh, after I, I ran into this issue in China that, that led me here, um, my passion is only this. I've decided that, you know, when you, you feel like you find a purpose in life, I, f I found my purpose. My purpose is to solve this problem, to bring education across the planet, um, starting with India. And I figured if I could, I figured if, if I can solve, if I can solve for one of the largest and most complicated countries in the world, we can solve it for the world. And you know, in, in, uh, United Nations, SDG4, the, the education goal, um, they've been failing for decades. And the, the report states that the biggest challenge they have and what they need is the world to come together, countries, governments, corporations, educators, all to work together into one system, which doesn't exist. And I didn't know that that was the case until I started building this company. And then when I read their, their report, I'm like, hey, we've accomplished you yeah. know, 15 of their 17 things they're trying to do. We've done it on right. our own. Um, so collaboration is critical, and I'm going to keep doing this until, until I die. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> well, we hope that you continue to build on that dream. Dipinder, what is the dream now? I mean, 11 years on, you've achieved a lot of what you didn't expect to achieve. Uh, uh, as you look into the future, where do you see Zomato over the next few years? And where, where do you see yourself in the next few years? 
I think I uh, personally take it day by day. Uh, I think there is a lot to learn every day and uh, life will go on. And I think Zomato, uh, 10 years from now, I want Zomato to enable clean food for everyone. Right, and um, and I'm not saying you should only eat salads. Like you should eat all the <laughs> yes, all clean the, foods doesn't only mean salads. Yeah, yes, like yeah. you should eat all the naans and uh, butter chickens you want, but the chicken inside the butter chicken should be clean. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, what do you order the most on Zomato? I am a Punjabi food fan, so dinner is Punjabi food every night. Like, on, so. Ordered on Zomato? Ordered on Zomato, oh, of course on Zomato. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, one last thing that I want to talk to you about, Dipinder, and I think that's an important uh, issue, uh, and that is about making the workforce a lot more equal. Uh, and that's something that, that I believe in, uh, and, and I know that that's something that you believe in as well. And I don't know, again, how many people in the audience know about this, but you decided to introduce use paternity leave uh, in Zomato as well. And it's been, what, a few months since you've done that? Almost, uh, yeah, more than a few months since, it, since about, you've done that. About nine months. About, ni about, <laughs> about nine months since you launched paternity leave. Yeah. How has that experience been? And, uh, uh, and, you know, take me through the rationale behind why you decided to do that. I, I think it's just, it, it just makes sense, right? Like, uh, there are... There are a lot of people at uh, Zomato uh, who are actually married within Zomato. Yeah, so you have a lot of Zomato couples. Zomato couples. Yeah. So, and now they're starting to have kids as well. And... Uh, so you have a lot of actually, Zomato babies. We actually call them Zomato <laughs> babies, yeah. So, uh, and I mean, we are all very good friends and uh, these guys, like, they don't really care about who is taking care of the child, Yeah. right? They want to, uh, they both want to focus on their careers as much as each other. And uh, I mean, I think they should have the flexi, flexibility to do that. That's it. Okay. And so you launch paternity leave and are you seeing the dads take up the offer? Absolutely. You are? Yeah. Well, then more power to you. And I do hope that that is an idea that gets taken forward by many more companies. Dipinder Goel, Brad and Jeremy, thanks very much for joining us here. We wish you the very best of luck. Appreciate you sharing your stories here with us at the HD Summit. Thank you so much. Thank you.